Good morning. First, I would like to take a minute to go around and have those at the table introduce themselves. I will begin with myself. My name is Brenda Wolf. I'm a board member and chair of the Communications and Stakeholder Engagement Committee. And to my left. Hi, I'm Rebecca Smondrowski, um, board member. Sabrina Hernandez, the recorder for the Board of, board of Education. Derek Turner, Chief Communications Officer. Meredith Williams, Communications Specialist. Lori Christina Webb, Chief of Staff for the Board. Araza Labad, Executive Director and Office of the Chief of School Support and Improvement. <laughs> Carla Silvestri, School Board Member. Thank you. As we begin this morning, we wanted to take a few minutes to talk about what this committee is about. There's been a lot of interest, and so we thought we would talk about the history and charge of the committee. Communi communication and community outreach are critical strategies for informing and engaging parents, students, and other stakeholders who make up MCPS. We know that community members receive a significant amount of information from us. They receive it daily, but countless numbers of individuals and organizations may be missing out on some of this information. Our challenge is to make ourselves heard among all the priorities and engaging with stakeholders without overwhelming them with information. As you may know, from 2004 to 2013, the board had a communications and public, public engagement committee. There was a sense at that time that communication and public engagement should be worked out as a committee of the whole rather than in committee. The committee was dissolved and issues regarding communication and engagement were discussed at the board table. We've heard from the community that as our population has grown and continued to diversify and as more and more communication modalities have been developed, communication and engagement are issues that really require the focus of a board committee. The committee's work will focus on two major areas, school-based communication and central office communication. The most effective and powerful communication to stakeholders comes from our schools. Each day, schools communicate directly with stakeholders via emails, letters, events, phone calls, interactions, and face-to-face uh, -face meetings. In a non-scientific but informative survey in 2018, respondents indicated overwhelmingly that communication from the school leadership was the most effective. We will be exploring best practices and looking for opportunities for improvement. It is also critical that stakeholders receive information about the mission, vision, values, and priorities of the board and the school system. This outreach, both proactive and reactive, must be timely, accurate, and effective for all of our stakeholders. We will be exploring best practices for central office communication and where we can do better. It is increasingly important that MCPS be strategic and innovative in its approach to communication. We must be willing to try and potentially fail using new tactics abandon long-standing but ineffective practices, mm -hmm. and push ourselves to engage hard-to-reach communities mm -hmm. to ensure that our messages are being heard. Communication and engagement is inherently linked to an equitable school system. We have invested heavily in creating outstanding educational opportunities for our students and building an infrastructure that supports access, but information is the first necessary ingredient. If you don't know about the opportunity, if you haven't heard about how to access that opportunity, you will never take advantage of it. <clears throat> we have to be willing to continue to innovate, to reach and communicate with all of our families and all of our students. That is fundamental to an equitable school system. As we move forward, we will cover such topics as engagement in the community, events and outreach in the community, crisis communications, innovations for the future, and the Maryland Public Information Act. 
At this time, I will turn it over to our Chief Communications Officer, Mr. Derek Turner. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ms. Wolf and committee members for, for having this committee. I think it's important for us to, to really work together and have a dialogue about communications for our school system. And I do want this to be a dialogue. I'm so excited to have a conversation. Uh, so if, if you want to interrupt me, please do, because I think this is where we're going to create new ideas uh, for moving our community forward. Um, so let's talk about the, the roadmap for today. So we're going to talk about the state of communications in Montgomery County Public Schools. We're going to talk about successes and failures, uh, because I, I, there's a quote that I love. Uh, we learn wisdom from failure much more than we do from success, and we've had some, some doozies of failures that have brought us forward and made us better as communicators. And innovation, how do we move the needle for our communities? How do we try something different? And how can we do it where we're not afraid to try and, and maybe miss the mark, but learn so many lessons? So let's get started. The current state of communications uh, in Montgomery County Public Schools, I think Ms. Wolf laid it out perfectly. Mm -hmm. The context is that there is so much noise in our community. People are getting hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of information coming from dozens of channels. So whether it's text messages or tweets or Snapchats or the radio or TV, you're constantly being bombarded with information that someone thinks is important to you. And our challenge every day is how do we break through that noise to make sure that our messages, things that are important to us, actually resonate? And every day we try to evolve, and every day the landscape evolves. There's a new app, there's a new tool that we have to compete with, and a new tool that may, we may have to adopt. So we're excited to, to be able to move and change as the, the landscape changes. So at the foundation, there are two prongs, as Ms. Wolf laid out, school-based communications and central office communications. And school-based communications really move the needle for our families uh, and, and have the greatest impact. Um, you know, the, the emails, the phone calls, the my MCPS portal where parents get grades and information about lunches. That's where parents have see the most impact and that's where families can really connect with school. And you mentioned the survey a bit earlier, Ms. Wolf, and I'll have uh, Ms. Williams talk a little bit more about the survey and some details. So we uh, conducted a communication survey in the fall of 2018 and that was with the goal of learning more about information consumption and how we could improve our practices. Um, the survey was translated into Spanish, French, Amharic, Korean, Chinese, and Vietnamese, which are the top languages that, is, that we tend to translate into, um, and distributed across a variety of platforms, including social media, our quick notes email newsletter, which goes out in all languages, um, and our website. We received a total of 1,244 responses from parents and guardians and staff and students. Um, in regards to response breakdown, we got 393 responses in English, 726 in Spanish, 24 in French, 18 in Amharic, 13 in Korean, 60 in Chinese, and 10 in Vietnamese. So we were pretty happy with the response rate that we had. Um, some of the key takeaways were that parents prefer email as a primary means of communication for general news and would prefer text messages for emergencies. Um, and that parents and guardians would prefer that we limit the number of platforms that they need to visit to stay up to date and streamline our communications. Um, the communication method preferences were email from school, email from the district, um, text messages for emergencies, and then the school website. Those were the top four platforms that people look to. Um, in regards to the most important news, people indicated overwhelmingly that calendar reminders, school closures and delays top their list of things they wanted to know about, um, school-specific information, information about academic programs, and school or district events. So we were able to take that information um, and use it as we recommend communication practices to the different groups that need to get information to students, and we're able to streamline some of our own. Can we have a I, have, I have a question. Um, did parents prefer email because they have a cell phone? I'm just curious about whether or not every, enough of our parents have access to the internet to have a computer at home, or, or is email preferred because they know they can get that on their cell phone? Do you know? That's a great question. We didn't ask about devices in this particular survey, but were we to conduct another survey this year, I think that would be a great question to include to learn more. Um, I do know that as far as our web traffic is concerned, there's a pretty even split between desktop and mobile users. Um, and some of that comes down to where somebody is on a given day and who's using, but it would stand to reason that some of those, those parents prefer because of email. 
Also, I wonder, um, I, I didn't see the question, so depending on how the questions were proposed, mm -hmm. someone might not, not have known that getting a text message instead of an email was one of the options necessarily as opposed to just for an emergency situation. Um, we did a tour of one of our uh, Montgomery County housing projects um, and I had a long talk with several of the people from that area who were saying that um, they don't have access to the internet and um, even if they do, they're at their jobs quite a bit and they can't go on even if they do get it on their phone. So mm -hmm. they prefer text messaging just based on the fact that they can sneak it out and look at it while they're at work and put it right back and don't have to. Um, so I'm just putting that out there as part. But it'd be great if we could get the results of the um, of the survey. Mm -hmm. Great. I would also I would also add to um, what Mrs. Smadrowski said, in that when I worked downtown D.C., I couldn't get emails. I mean, because you did, the phone service wasn't good in the building, <laughs> but texts always seemed to go through. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting. So that might be one thing to consider when you do your next survey. Sure. sure. And one of the things we can do as, as maybe a, a part of this committee is send out uh, a new survey for the 2019-2020 mm -hmm. school year mm -hmm. that has all of, incorporates all of the questions that we might still have and uh, helps us get more information every year because that will help us grow and improve. Right. We um, passed the resolution that we would do some sort of text messaging um, outreach by the end of this school year. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if that might be uh, part of the survey, might be very useful in terms of progressing that throughout this school year. Correct. So, are letters or is that snail mail or is that email? <laughs> so, so that's actually letters and backpacks. A lot of our elementary schools yeah. still take letters, print letters, and stuff them in kids' backpacks. Mm -hmm. What we found that's is that th that is that is not particularly effective for some families because kids ball the <laughs> letters up true. and they never come out of the backpack. Uh, so, depending on what child, type of child you have, how effective that is as a strategy. You do have to dig through their backpacks. <laughs> uh, one of the key elements that I, I want to raise in this section, and we'll, we'll talk about it as, it as an innovation later, is the face-to-face -face communication. Ms. Mondrowski, you've mentioned this many times, and our community has mentioned this. When you walk into a school building, that first interaction with that front office can make or break the family's experience with the school system. It's so important, and we need to, we need to really put some focus on how do we move the needle for those families, because if you speak a different language and the person at the front desk doesn't, that doesn't mean you have to have a bad interaction, but how can we help bridge that gap for families? What steps can we take? Um, and I know I, I'll turn to Ms. Webb, because there, this effort was done in the past and it had a, did it have an outcome? So, so in years past, I've been here a while, there, <laughs> there, there was, um, let's call it a secret shopper kind of um, um, <laughs> a, um, program where, Either you know principals would ask, or in, in in conjunction with their director would ask the uh, office of, of, of family um, engagement to do kind of a secret shopper at the at the school front office and see what the what both what the strengths and the opportunities were. You know, and, and so then that would be used to kind of deconstruct that and figure out how to improve the service families were getting. Um, so I think it was um, pretty effective, um, but it was a self-selected group who were looking for improvement in that area. And that was about 10 years ago, correct? Yes. Uh, Eric Davis was yeah. the, yeah. <laughs> if that situates it in time. So is that something that we're looking to bring back? We should. I think that's an opportunity for us to, again, improve that, that first welcoming experience. And, and there's a couple of techniques, and I'd love for this committee to help us explore what those strategies are. I, I just want to agree with um, Ms. Silvestri that I think that, um, you know, those type of, it's not, they're not intended to be gotchas, but it's, mm -hmm. it's what is reality, because, you know, we often say at the table here, we hear all these great things, it's not necessarily happening in every school, and so the being able to go in, I mean, I, I do that all the time, I'll stop in, and even here in some of the offices, I'll, I'll walk up and it's just like, a, how long does it take somebody to just say hi, <laughs> even, you know, make you feel awkward or like, you know, hello. So um, I think that those type of activities can be very, very beneficial to the schools and our families and stuff. So. And, and we talked about noise earlier, and I think this is a good time to look at this list. 
if you are a parent of two children, you may get three emails, two phone calls, a letter in a backpack, and have an event that night. And so when we talk about the, the balance between too much in content and information and, and not enough, this is where every parent struggles every day about what to filter through. And this is just from MCPS and their school. Imagine if you take a step back and they have their work email, their work life, their other yeah. things going on. So we just need to be strategic about uh, how we reach out to communities through the school. But then there's essential office communication. Uh, so there's three key parts to central office communication. There's the crisis communication, which um, is what most people see. Uh, when there's uh, an evacuation at a school, when there's uh, an issue, a missing student, all those pieces actually come through the central office of communications so that the school itself can deal with the, the boots on the ground, can deal with the students, can deal with the staff, and we take that burden off of them to help support them because that's going to help them uh, close the crisis, move forward. Uh, and so there's really a great partnership between the schools and the central office communications team and uh, OSSI. Every single crisis, we're all working together, all putting our hands in to make sure that that crisis is resolved as quickly as possible. Then, of course, we have proactive communications. Uh, we're constantly trying to reach out to community members through newsletters and uh, emails and phone calls, and we'll talk about those later. But that's, that's actually the bulk of the day-to-day the -day work of, of what we do in communications. But often that gets covered up by the reactive communications because when a crisis comes, you never know what the conversation is going to be. So while your focus on the day might be X, the outcome of the conversations for your day might be why, because something's happened at a school, a new piece of information happened in the county. Um, what I love and I struggle with in Montgomery County is that we're so interconnected. What happens in one part of the community affects the entire part of the community, which sometimes is great because we can all stand together, but sometimes can be a distraction if something happens at one school, but then it becomes the conversation at all schools when they're, they're not really related, but it really distracts from the work. So let's talk about some of the tactics we have. Uh, emails and phone calls. This is what I call the traditional tactics. Can I just interrupt and go back for one second? Sure. So I'm looking at this, and is there somewhere that, like, is this something that we sent out to the, for example, Seneca Valley High School community, Clarksburg, Northwest, or whatever? Because to me, this is so, and when we talk about our communications, one of my issues is we tend to send out long notifications of stuff. But if we were to send out just something simple like this, where people can either be like, yep, that's interesting to me, and I'm going to save it. This kind of, except it doesn't have the, well, it does have dates on there. Um, you know, like, it's just an easy, here's your timeline. <laughs> if, as part of that question, my, I wonder, do you have a system that lets us distinguish between emails like this is important you really need to look at this this okay you know you, you it's information but it's not information you have to have right now is there any way that we could help parents know what they really must look at so certainly I'll, I'll answer the second part first so yes we can put urgent and identify messages um, in the header and, and change colors and fonts um, but what we know is that the inbox grows rapidly. At any given time, someone can receive 20 emails and where that email stacks up in the list and whether they've seen it or not. It's always been a challenge and more and more between spam information, things you've signed up for intentionally, some you haven't actually signed up for. So really finding that balancing act and, and seeing what those A-B tests are, uh, that's testing it with uh, urgent in the beginning or not. Uh, a certain font or not to see if that moves the needle. And certainly we can, something we can try more of as we move forward. And I'll pass to Ms. Williams regarding the... Uh, I mean, that might be one of the things you would want to include on your survey if parents are interested in that as opposed to just doing it because I asked you about it. But mm -hmm. I do think it, it would be yes. helpful if I were a parent to know you definitely need to look at this. Mm -hmm. and, right. Uh, if you're you in know, this community, so. you want to at least look at it. Yeah. And Ms. Mondrowski, in answer to your question, what you're looking at on the screen here is an example of an internal communications plan. Um, this in particular is a snapshot of a plan that we created to make sure people understand what's going on with the boundary study that's taking place in the up county area, as well as um, Seneca Valley and its high school program options, because there are some overlapping timelines in um, high school program application deadlines and um, boundary decisions. So what this is here is a plan internally for our communications team and other departments to think about 
tactics for reaching different groups and when. So this is um, essentially an overview for us of all tactics that we can use to communicate about important issues. But if I might yeah. add, um, the local school level version of this mm -hmm. um, is that through their communications to parents and on their website, they would have posted, for example, um, the back to school night information. They would have posted the dates that for elementary schools is the distribution mm -hmm. of um, flyers because that's a set schedule. Mm -hmm. So that type of information for what it would look like for a parent or community member usually comes home in the backpack or in the newsletters from the school or via the website. There's a running calendar feature um, where that type of information for what it would look like for the public is posted and communicated in that way. So they would get the information, but without the details around how many messages are coming out on October 30th around student outreach. <laughs> Which, and you know, we laugh because it may seem, but, but factually when our community talks about transparency, in my opinion, this is exactly what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that when they say, oh, well, I never got a Connect Ed on the 15th, you know, did we can look back and say, did we send it out or did they just get it and ignore it and not realize they received it or or whatever. But um, this to me is a very, um, very transparent way of showing the efforts that we're making to reach a community, but they should know that we're making those efforts. And again, this just to um, make sure I'm clear, this is the communications plan for boundary study communications and high school program options only. For That's correct, and this yeah. is just a snapshot of the, the full plan. Okay. Um, so a question about crisis communications. I think as uh, in our board emails, we gotten one or two emails from parents where something happened at the school and they had, they expected mm -hmm. notice and they didn't get notice. Mm -hmm. uh, what, are there instances where they're not going to get a communication from the principal saying this happened today, uh, drills or just to does tack on to that. Yeah, I had on my list that consistency seems is very important and it seems very erratic. Some schools mm -hmm. put out yeah. notifications very quickly. Other schools, it feels like there's we know that something's happened and parents are waiting up until 11 o'clock at night texting me, um, oh, should I send my kids to school tomorrow? And because they haven't heard anything from the school, you know. What are we doing about that kind of stuff? Sure, so crisis communications and, and when we communicate and what we communicate depends on the context. Uh, sometimes when there's police matters involved, we're not allowed to communicate on certain issues. Uh, sometimes it could be something as small as a, a fire alarm and um, the school has, has a relationship with the school where they've decided, we're only gonna send out fire alarm things in, you know, in the mornings and we'll tell them the parents the next morning if it didn't interrupt the schedule. Mm -hmm. Some schools, if the, it's a fire alarm goes off, they have established a community where they send it out immediately. Um, and we really want the principals to own their community and own how they want to be messaged. Uh, what we know, some, some communities, the first thing they do when there's a crisis is they call their PTA president. Other, other communities, the first thing they do is they call their uh, leadership team in to have a meeting. So, and, and we want them to do what best works for their community. And because and we know the cookie cutter model doesn't work for everyone and we shouldn't uh, force that upon them. But as long as they are communicating and as long as we're, um, they're getting the message out in an appropriate time, and again, we have concerns when we don't get message out on time, um, we, we want them to be able to, to move freely within those boundaries. I appreciate the flexibility that you're talking about, but I'd be curious, like, who oversees what schools send out? Because another example, of, you know, of a message that I've read from, it shouldn't, in my opinion, these some of these things should not come with their personal opinions on some of the stuff as as much as a notification of an instance. And I see. I'm not sure I'm following you. Can you give an example? And I can. Not, not, not to. I won't mention any schools. Or, no. But but a, a memo that would be sent out where the principal would say, would be going on about um, their personal opinions of what may or may not have happened, particularly when there's still an investigation going on mm -hmm. in terms of whether, I just feel like they should be, here's what happened, because you don't always necessarily know what the right story is, and we talk about that all the time, especially when there's police investigation going on. 
So most letters, unless they're a fire alarm or something uh, on the very lower level, like a, a leak in the building, um, come through our office and we review all those messages to make sure that they are accurate and factual. There, there's still occasions with 207 schools that schools sometimes miss the step and, and don't send it through us first. Um, but we luckily have the great OSSI team who tries to catch those. Uh, and, and I say that they, they do a great job of saying, wait, have you flagged this and run this through communications to get a, a final review? Um, and, and we're always improving that process to make sure that we're, we're quick to respond, but we also are looking through making sure it's accurate and factual and that we're not um, misleading folks about what, what has happened. You know, I can appreciate the flexibility that you want to allow principals. My question would be, is there a list of crises that mandate certain mm -hmm. things yeah. happen that are consistent across the system? Yeah, anything above like a, a fire alarm and the, the run of the mill. What, what's... But see, run of the mill, I mean, what you might consider run of the mill, I might consider as a parent, you know, I, I wanted to know about. So I'm trying to figure out, is there a baseline that all schools must adhere to? So, yes, I mean, there's a certain threshold. Anything that's police involved, criminal activity, something significant that interrupts the school day, there's an expectation that you're going to communicate in those situations. Mm -hmm. What the, the kind of middle ground is, is there's a lot of experience that we've never had before. Uh, we, we run into crises that no one's ever heard of before. Uh, and so we're triaging it on the spot saying, this makes sense to communicate or this didn't actually interrupt the school day, but we might want to communicate about, communicate about it anyway. So we really so, want to give ourselves flexibility. So, so <clears throat> let me just interrupt you there. So when you have that kind of situation, that's new and you've had to think about it and come up with, do you, do you decide at that point whether or not that should be added to your crisis communication for consistency across schools? Do you understand what I'm asking you? So reflectively, after the message has gone out and how the community has responded and if they said, thanks for letting us know this, or there was no response or how the, the, the school felt afterwards in the next in the following days, that's the best way to judge whether it actually falls into the, we need to make this mandatory. Because if we, we rushed to send something out and the community said, thanks, but why was it, why did this seem so urgent? What, what was the urgency behind this? We might say, okay, we have a little more flexibility. If we send it out at eight o'clock that, that night and they're saying, why didn't you send this out at five o'clock or six o'clock? Then we know this might be something that we need to add to the list and make sure that we are, we're more proactive in communicating. But we're always learning, again, the, the failure of, of these opportunities where we, might not have gotten it right the first time. It lets us make sure we get it right the next time. So do we do we <clears throat> do we remind um, principals about which things really should right. be communicated right away? So I mean, yearly or something like that, so that right because we're changing we're principals testing, all yeah. the time, and right. and I'm just wondering about the training around this sort of thing. Right, and and you're absolutely correct, and that's uh, as Mr. Turner said, we're reflective in moments. But when the directors and area associate superintendents have their scheduled meetings with at school administrators, then those are opportunities where we take those learning opportunities and make it a teachable moment for all of our school leaders. We also have regular meetings throughout the year. They're central services meetings with principals. And those are designated times when we've gone through an opportunity and we know that it's important that we kind of reset and reframe for all administrators. Those uh, meetings, you know, going back to the secret shopper days of <laughs> 10 years ago, was kind of when we started having these meetings specifically for policy changes uh, and types of practice changes that we wanted to make sure got to all principals. So those are designated times where we have that face-to-face -face for all administrators. In addition to that, we have a principal's handbook. It's online. It's constantly updated with changes and, and sample letters and memos. And as we have new circumstances and realize the best way in today's context to communicate, we update with those sample letters. And so principals, um, along with other school leadership and central office staff, have access to that. Um, and so we let them know when we're making changes and updates so that we're not always having to send another memo because as we discussed <laughs> earlier, with the traffic and volume of that type of communication, it would get lost. But we have those intentional times where we can have face-to-face -face with them. 
um, as a group, as a collective, and then with individual communities where we know where we have to uh, be responsive to what that community's need is, um, that we're also reminding those in face-to-face -face opportunities. Well, the face-to-face -face sounds, you know, very good, but I'd be, I would question the, the opportunities from when central office goes right. out to the school and talks to them because I, I would be looking for consistency and in information sharing, if I could use that term. Absolutely. And that's what I, I don't know that I'm hearing if those kind of meetings occur. Now, when you have the, the sort of central office and bring everybody in, okay, I know everybody has heard the same message, but I would wonder how you know everybody's heard the same message in the other situation. And I think that's um, part of how we get to that is that we we call them huddles, but we have these quick conversations with key stakeholders. Um, so on any given instance, the communications office might be involved if there's a need for, if it's a transportation related piece or some incident that involves transportation. We're all on the phone making those decisions and that way we all go back out with the same message for the people in our office who are responsible for carrying out the implementation or the response to that. And those are our, our teachable learning moments and that what that's what gets incorporated into making sure we're all delivering the same message when we in single incidents or in collective incidents because we're <laughs> recording what our decisions are so that we can use that for the next step. And you found that that's effective? We found that the last two years, I believe, when we've started using this model, that it's moving us in the right direction. There's always opportunities for improvement sure. and there's always a reflection of the missed opportunity. <laughs> but we found that this practice um, has really helped us get closer to that point. Of consistency but so there's there's no actual like if this happens we will send out a note if this happens we can consider it if this you understand right there's a minimal threshold but you know I, I don't know how to stress how important it is that every situation may have its own nuance um, and if the police are involved or any other agency or any type of investigation is involved, mm -hmm. that might shift the dynamic of that minimal threshold mm -hmm. because of the circumstances in that unique uh, situation. But fire drills, was it a major disruption to the day? If we take something like that, that's, right. you know, if it's not a major disruption to the day, that would not be considered a mandatory communication right. mm -hmm. as, as one example. So is, is this something that's written down that we could get a copy of and take a look at? I mean, I don't want to see the letters themselves. I just want to see what kind of instructions are behind the letters, okay? Certainly my office and communications could, can provide that. Could you that. Remind, uh, to remind me, if I'm a new parent, uh, what form captures my preferred method of communication? There's a yellow card that they get, and now it's through the My MCPS portal where you can sign up for, this is my primary uh, phone number, primary means of communications, backup, in emergency situation, dial all these, these three numbers mm -hmm. um, so that we don't miss you. Are, are all of our parents doing that? Are they actually going in and signing up and putting that information Just the, the, the technology there? challenges, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's technology challenges, but... At mandatory, they have to have information in there. We can't start the school year without okay. some parent There's information some about how to contact them. And, uh, <laughs> and we've moved towards having the electronic op as an option. Everyone gets it hard copy to make changes on. And depending on the household, you SPL. have an option, right? You have an option, which I think now is a pre-printed white it, form. Yeah. <laughs> that comes you still, home. Call, it you would still yeah. call it the yellow card, but now it's a pre-printed white form that comes home at the beginning of the year. All of the information from the prior year is pre-filled. Um, parents can say, mm, I don't have anything to change, and it stays there. They can handwrite the change and send the form back or they have the option of going in and updating the information for themselves. And as a best practice, we encourage, because things change throughout the year, mm -hmm. as a best practice, we encourage schools to do like a reboot mid-year mid to say if there's anything that's changed, please let us know. And I know also a lot of schools use back to school night as an opportunity mm -hmm. to gather more information for that card if they, mm -hmm. if they feel like they don't have enough. 
Okay, I have, before you move on, I have one other question. I want to get back to this communications plan, not specifically about the plan, but it's about, you mentioned that I could go to the school's website and I'm going to find some basic information about this. Well, in, in trying to find information on a website myself, I found that, that they're inconsistent as to when they actually post information. So let's say I'm, I'm part of the Seneca Valley family of people that are going to be in this boundary study. How, how are we ensuring that everybody that's connected to this is getting the same information? Because I think, I'm sorry, I think you and I talked about um, transportation and it doesn't all go up at the same time. So you're not controlling that because it's controlled by the school, right? Correct. Uh, we have 207 schools with 207 websites, yeah. and they all have some of the same content. That's kind of the baseline. But we, we allow the flexibility so they can create the website that best fits the needs and they can update as they see fit. And each school has their own webmaster who ends up updating the site. Um, and we encourage them when we give them the information and say, please post this. Uh, but what we know is that the webmaster also has other duties in the school. Sometimes they're a paraeducator. Sometimes they're an office administrator. So they might not have the, the time to immediately post that. But we, we know that they have the information and we, we encourage them to take that next step. Well, I'm wondering, and this is just a thought, and you, clearly you know more about this kind of thing than I do. But it would seem to me that if you have system information, like this is system information, it should not be left up to the school to post it. That you should be able to post it from here on every website of every school that would be affected, let's say, by a boundary study. Likewise with the transportation stuff, that you should be able to just push that out from here to all the websites. Now. You know, maybe that's wishful thinking. I don't know, but it would seem to me that things that are across the board or across a, a certain group of schools could be done centrally. So we, we do have the ability to push some central content out, and um, we can talk about this a little bit more when we talk about websites as well. But um, you'll notice right now all of our schools have a link to Be Well 365, the, the new initiative on their web pages. So we have we we do have a couple schools. Yes, we do we do have the ability to share uh, system wide information. And again, this is an internal document. You're not going to see this no, on no, any. No. Correct. No, but whatever information they do post about it, and um, she said they they post some information. It should be that same information on every school that's going to be affected by any sort of boundary study for Seneca Valley. That's all I'm saying. So, well, actually, before we go on, I just uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that because of the partnership we've been talking about between all the offices. We talk about the Office of Communications, but it's really a, communications is a system-wide effort mm -hmm. uh, from the schools through OSSI, <laughs> through mm -hmm. uh, the community engagement, through uh, student family support engagement, uh, through every office, through Octo, who helps with the technology to make it go, <laughs> through uh, OSA, make sure we have the right data and the student information in there. Mm -hmm. it, it really is, any, any particular communication requires the hands of, of everyone in this building or every office in this building. So just make sure that I give credit where credit is for the early due. <laughs> uh, so emails and phone calls. Th this is kind of the traditional way that we've reached people uh, for the last 20-ish years since the inception of email. Um, and so we can send system-wide messages, and, and we do um, for, you'll, you'll see snow days, you'll get a system-wide email, like, by the way, school is closed. Um, we can also target to specific audiences, like we were talking with Seneca Valley. We can target the Seneca Valley cluster and say, all families in this, this area, you're going to receive this email from central office about the boundary events that are coming up. One of the, the challenges, again, filling someone's inbox is not the most effective way. And, and more and more phone calls are becoming ineffective because people when don't we, pick people don't pick up, they see a phone number, they're like, hey, this, this can't be an emergency. Um, and, and they hear a robotic voice sometimes when yeah. we're, they're processing through. And, and if that doesn't turn you off from the phone call, you're just like, I, I don't have time for this. I don't have time to listen to a minute and a half message about what's going on in the world. Um, so more and more we're relying on emails and, and other tactics. But one of the innovations we've done in the last two years is actually email students directly. Um, we, we have always relied on parents to, hey, pass this on to your kid. Get this information to your, to your child. 
and we know that our parents are busy and have many other things to do and might not be paying attention to the message that we're delivering to them. So in the last two years, we've actually allowed our, our system to email directly to all secondary students, so middle school students and high school students in MCPS, one under an MCPS account and one under the uh, student member of the board's account. And we found that there's great response to that, that they're hearing directly from the school system on priority issues, especially when they hear directly from the SMOB. Um, and it's one that will continue to, to evolve as we move forward. Can, can he do one about our program offerings and stuff like that so that kids know, you know, in advance, like, hey, there's a lot to be, to be looked at in terms of career pathways and program offerings and stuff like that? Sure, and, and one of the things that, that we are actually working on doing is creating a more scheduled, system-wide message to students so that they can interact and connect directly with, especially those, those kids who are in high school who make their own decisions uh, often without their parents' uh, feedback, uh, so making sure we can interact with them directly. Could you give me an example of a message you sent to students mm -hmm. in the past year? Sure. So uh, last year, the first message was around uh, the addition of condoms in all high schools. That was the first message we sent out to all students, which was, I'm sure, uh, a shock to them, but an important message that they all need to hear, sure hear from us. <laughs> and, and we did. We, we started talking to them about, about that as a tool and how to engage in a virtual online program, which we'll talk about later. We sent messages about bullying and hazing. We sent messages about uh, the back to school fair. Uh, the SMOB has sent messages about things that are important to them. Um, the start of the new school year, um, Mr. Tinbite sent a message just a week ago about kicking off the new school year in a voice that was directed at students. And we saw the response uh, was so great because people are interested in hearing his voice about issues that are important to all students. And, kid, and students have, when do they, what do they use MCPS email for? So they have to use their MCPS email to log into their account. So it's a, a G Suite tool uh, and it's the mcpsmd.net. And so all kids have access to it. And the great thing now is that they can actually forward their uh, .NET account to a personal account if they want to. So that if they don't want to check their .NET account, they can always have it forward to their, their other personal. So they don't have to sign up with two email addresses. If they just have to figure out how to forward it. Co correct. You only have to sign up once. <laughs> Got it. One of the things we heard when the students came in is that a lot of them don't know what to do if they're having issues, whether it be bullying, depression, whatever. I heard you talk about the kind of messages you were sending out. Did you send out anything about the Be Well 365 initiative directly to the students? And maybe with some sort of information about who they can contact mm -hmm. in their building if they're having problems? I'll have to check that. I don't have a... a a Could good memory of all that, that was went out. Because I will say, even though it is on most, uh, I'm assuming on every school's website, the Be Well, it's generally very far at the bottom, and I'm not sure how people go to that. So um, go down that far or we are recognized. I will say Kennedy's um, website, their mobile site anyways, uh, Kennedy High Schools, is very, very nice. And they do have quick links, um, again, kind of towards the bottom, but it says some, uh, there's one of them is, see who your counselor is. Which yeah, I thought was I think, I think at least that something. we heard that quite a bit yes. when the students came in. If you could send out a message, if you haven't done that already, yeah. that would be very helpful. Maybe get Nate to send it out in, in you know, yep. through his network. Sure. I think that that would be great. Um, and how do you know students are reading this? Are so we can we can or? tell from responses. The actual students are saying thank you for this. Sometimes students are nice about it, sometimes they're not, but we know they're reading it or they wouldn't respond. <laughs> it's, it's much how I feel about the, the social media Twitter when we close schools in the morning. Mm -hmm. I know that, that students are paying attention because they respond with mean things to me. Um, <laughs> but at least I, I know they know that school is closed that day uh, or open, depending on the day. One of the things we did, I, I think it's worth noting, we sent out the, the community safety message uh, beginning of the year about all the ways that we keep kids safe, which talked about Be Well. And we also sent that to all the students as well. So that was a, a parallel message. So sometimes we're not just sending unique to kids, we're sending it to everyone in our universe. I just hope we were remembering to keep things short because no one is reading more these days if you have to keep scanning down. It's Correct. <laughs> I always say, get the first, get the important stuff out in what I see on my screen. But I also want to say with regard to the Be Well 365, not just that that's available, but that there is somebody in their building. Can you tell them 
who in their building, not by name necessarily, but by position, they should see if they're having a problem. And, and that's actually one of the, the unique tactics where we would leverage our school to send out that message because they can uh, put in the name and say, this is X person is the right person to contact because those are the relationships. If they see it from a central office or from even from, from Mr. Tim Bite's account, they'll say, what, how does he know this? But if they hear that from their counselor or principal, those kind of messages really have a great impact. My hope is that by the mental health week, by the start, or you know, by the end of by the end of mental health week, mm -hmm. every school will have done an introduction of all of their um, be well staff um, and everything uh, at the school level. So. Thank you. All right. This is our favorite topic, text messaging. And I know Ms. Wondrowski has a, 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 a long uh, stake in this interest. Uh, so uh, right now, we, we do have a text messaging platform, um, and that's Alert MCPS. So in emergency situations, uh, the county has a system that they allow us to use. Uh, it sends messages in English and Spanish. The the foundation of it is that's an opt-in system. We don't, we don't have the information to input into the system and we haven't gotten permission to just take our database of information and, and put it into their system. Um, one of, that's, that's one of the challenges that, that we're facing. The, the other is that we don't collect cell phone numbers. So as we talk about the yellow card or the, the white card now, I guess, and the online version, there's, there's no section for uh, cell phone number or a personal device number. And so we need to actually start collecting those as a separate entity. So people fill in their contact information by, maybe it's their home, maybe it's their cell phone, although a lot of people are cell phone, depending on the generation. Mm -hmm. But we need to, before we do a big leap into text messaging, making sure that we get the, the right information for folks or we don't want to spend 75% of our text effort going to people's home landlines that they don't get the information. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, this is a certainly a priority both from the resolution and, and just as we know it's in emergency situations, it's so effective for someone to get a text message mm -hmm. uh, rather than a phone call. Uh, we, we can tell you about um, what, what, you know, an opportunity, a failure that we had three years ago. Um, I don't know if you remember, we ended up uh, putting all schools into a shelter in place because there was an active shooter in the community. Mm -hmm. So we thought we were being proactive. We sent out uh, emails to everyone in the community letting them know, and then we sent out a phone call. It took an hour and 15 minutes for that phone call to reach the last family. By the time it reached the last family, we had already sent two more messages giving them updates. Why is that? The system processes phone calls in just a, such a slow way that it can't process 160,000 phone calls in an hour. It, what it has to do is it, it just goes through one by one by one, mm -hmm. and then by that time, we're starting back over. And we learned that the phone call is not the effective strategy in that emergency mm -hmm. situation. It actually does a disservice because people get misinformation depending yeah. on when they receive their call. Mm -hmm. But the school closure alert, that goes to 164,000. Correct. So text message doesn't have the same bandwidth issues as a phone call does. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, text messages, they all go up. And do you know how many families participate in Alert MCPS? What percentage? So, so it, it's a small number. We have, mm. uh, and, and I don't want to get this wrong, somewhere in the, I think the 30,000 range, which is a fraction of the, the, the amount of community members we have. Okay. Um, and what, what we also know is that there's no, people aren't opting out of the system either. So if you signed up for mm -hmm. Alert MCPS six years ago, you might still be getting those messages even yep. though you don't have a kid in the system anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not clean data anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of our concerns about if we tried to send something non-emergency through the system, we wouldn't know who we're actually reaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so print materials. I, I know that people think that print materials um, have lost value, and, and they do. They're, they're kind of expensive to produce, but they aren't effective when we're trying to reach people that we, don't, we have a hard time reaching. Um, we have a great digital database of everyone in the MCPS community. What we don't have are people who are coming into the, the preschool or in, in um, the daycare programs, people who are going to have kids in MCPS. What we don't have is stakeholders outside of MCPS. Mm -hmm. And so we need to figure out how to reach those. And print materials have been a, a great tool. So we've gone to daycares uh, and preschools to pass out uh, information about the immersion program. Uh, we've gone to rec centers to pack out, pass out, and, and libraries to pass out information about the back to school fair. So, so these actually are quite helpful tools. We've actually put up banners um, 
uh, outside of schools that say immersion program, sign up here and, here, and here's the website so that when people drive by, yeah. they can see those. Um, again, there's, there's a lot of cost associated with those. And what we don't know is how many people, once we drop them off the rec center, actually pick them up and act on them. So unlike the digital tools, we don't have any analytics that can help us decide, is this a good use of our funds or is it not? Well, we do know that as, even though we won't know exactly how many people acted on it, we know it's more than none if we had nothing there. So <laughs> That's exactly right. I always love to ask people, how did you hear about yep. this? So if that could be built into, well, into everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. yeah. That's great. That's point, yes. Right? So newsletters. Um, we have a lot of newsletters in MCPS. Yeah. These are the, the three that come through the uh, Office of Communications. Uh, quick Notes, which goes to all 164 going on, uh, potentially 165,000 families uh, every other week. And it's short bites of the key priorities in the school system, uh, upcoming events, really great news about our schools. Um, that ends up in the Quick Notes. Um, and this is a good time for me to pause and, and really shout out the Language Assistance Services Unit. So Quick Notes goes out in our top six languages, which if I can name quickly, I think, uh, in addition to English, it's Spanish, um, Korean, Vietnamese, Chinese, Amharic, and French. French. I was going to say I'm assuming French. Um, <laughs> and, and rising at a really high clip, uh, Portuguese. Oh, so... Um, we're, we're seeing this, this growing population, and that's why we need to meet people where they are. So we send out quick notes in all six languages, um, and it's not just that we send it out the same message, but we actually tailor it to that language audience based on input from PCCs and the language specialists in the LASU office. Can I, can I interrupt you a second there? So I know we send out stuff in six different languages. So when you use Alert MCPS, you're only using two languages. What are the other groups doing? I mean, how are they receiving information? Right. So, so that's a, a difficult task. So uh, Alert MCPS is the text messaging platform, but we have um, our email platforms can send in all languages. So that's, that, that's a barrier that, that we've able, we're able to jump in uh, email, but we can't handle in the text messaging. But as we bring on the new student information system, we're hoping that can be part of this. The, the struggle we have, um, and, and we've, we're always trying to evolve with, is the characters of different languages. Um, so mm -hmm. sometimes systems aren't built to do Amharic. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a challenge that we're, we're constantly looking into. So when, when the new system comes on, will this be a system you can use instead of using the county system? Yes, I think we'll move all of our folks from the county system, scrub that list to make sure we don't have duplicates mm -hmm. and people can opt out if they want to and really bring everything into an MCPS platform. And how, um, how well are we, are multiple language communities accessing quick notes in their language and by how much would you say? So we're actually seeing significant access through Amharic and through Spanish. Um, what we see is that those families are, there's a video that we've added to, to all of the languages so that people can get a short summary of those mm -hmm. and we have it in the six languages uh, spoken by one of our translators or and interpreters. Mm -hmm. And what we see is lots of clicks on an Amharic one. It's reaching that community at a, at a high level. That's good. What we're not seeing is the, the French community, right? Because it's so diverse and across the board. Um, uh, and we're seeing um, uh, uh, obviously continued growth in the Spanish language community uh, through quick notes, but we also do uh, Este Semana, which is a weekly program that we send to our Spanish-speaking families. Do you have a section about the board news in Quick, in quick Notes? So, so depending on work? when there is a board meeting, it usually has some reference to the, the wrap-up or the roundup of the last board meeting. But we can certainly include more board information. What about like links to um, committee meetings to be able to watch and stuff like that? That's something that I've told people in the past, you know, oh, we, did, we talked about that at special populations, for example, and they've struggled with going in to find the meeting. Is there a way of making it a, a quick, like, here's the kid, recent meetings that I've had, just click here and I'll take you, not to the board docs document, <laughs> but to the actual video of the meeting. <laughs> sure, and that's something we can explore. One of the things that we've been trying to do is shorten quick notes, um, because it used to be a long, right. from the 20s, right. like, eight page document that people would have to sort through and what we've tried to do is really shorten it and, and what we can think about is how do we elevate a board section so they can click through that link and then find more board information rather than having to scroll down through through more yeah. content I mean the 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 images are 
important, but yeah. everything should be read more, read more, right? Um, uh, there was something there. Uh, I really like your press releases after board meetings mm -hmm. because I think they yeah. just they give you a real high level summary of what happened in the board meeting. And so, if um, if you if we've tried this and find that there is some, if anyone's clicking <laughs> on this, yeah. uh, I think that would be a nice package to include there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the next uh, tool we have the traditional loser is the bulletin uh, and uh, that goes to every staff member every week um, and it's really just kind of the, the highlights of what they need to know to, to not necessarily do their job but to kind of live in the MCPS workplace it has a lot to do with like professional systems um, benefits that they might get um, and then really a celebration of educators and, and staff so uh, about once or twice a month we have a, some, a section called tell me more and it's really a, a profile of of an educator and what we find is that those are the the most read stories because people see themselves reflected in the in the story and we always hear that the person ends up getting lots of phone calls like i didn't know that about you uh, after the story goes out um, and our most recent newsletter is what's good mcps and we've heard from the community we hear a lot of the, the tough stories, the difficult situations, MCPS in the news every day. What's, where does all the good stuff live? And so we create an aggregate of all the good stories that, that we're getting, um, all the positive things that we want to celebrate in one place. Because actually they highly outweigh the negative stories, but you people remember the, the hard things than the, the great celebrations. Uh, and so that's our latest newsletter. We send it out to our partners in the county, um, our PTA folks, just so they have a sense of all the great things that are happening and it's featured prominently on our website can I just make a suggestion could I, I you might already have it on there but um, I love the the what's good idea but I've read the, some of the articles and they're they're great there's nice celebrations of stuff but I think it would be really nice to have like um, the did you know um, like posted throughout this building in different areas I'll see a, a sign you know on the Stalls of the bathrooms, for example, or the doors are going to enter. Yeah. Did you know that last year we served, you know, one million meals or whatever? Um, I think people are interested in that kind of stuff, and it's it's one sentence. It doesn't have to be a big story, but it's a, just a hey. Did you know that we do this? Did you know that we have thirty three thousand students that live in poverty? If you'd like to do something to help out, click here, or you know, just little. Quick facts, I think people always find very interesting and um, informative, good ways to get to know us as a system a little better. Did you use your contacts from Quick Notes to populate what's good MCPS? Or no, so, so right now this is in a, a partner pilot program where we're sending it out to the MCC PTA, we're sending it out to our county partners, and really exploring how, how they get feedback. Um, we're going to add a video component, and once that component is added into it, uh, we'll send it out to the entire community. Okay. Um, How often do each of these come out? So Quick Notes comes out every two weeks, the Bolton comes out every week, and What's Good comes out once a month. And, and just on top of this, I, there, there are plenty of other newsletters that come out from MCPS. Uh, yeah. uh, I know, that's uh, right. Uh, outside it, and I want to welcome my, my colleague Everett Davis to the table. Um, there, <laughs> there are, there's Equity Matters, there's the Restorative Justice Newsletter, there's the IT Newswire, there's the Wellness uh, Newsletter. So there's tons of opportunities and tons of pieces of information. This year, one of our efforts is to consolidate and bring together some of these and bring them in the same style and format so that when people want to access this information, it's clear where they can find it uh, and it's not ad hoc. Because um, there's a lot of, lots of good information. It's just lots of information. Yeah, it, it sounds to me like we, we have a number of different things going out that people need to know about, but maybe they don't need the long version. So you could consolidate some of it into these because you... You just named four or five other things other right. than these That's three. And, and it's really sort of email overload after a yeah. while. And, and that is the challenge that we've talked about. So, the, I mean, the balance some of, of it you could probably put in right. the quick notes or mm -hmm. the bulletin. Yep. Even uh, the bottom is and, and, and we're, we're hoping to do that and bring more content into one place. Uh, if you get five new newsletters a day, you're mm -hmm. not going to read four, you're going to read zero. <laughs> well, and that's true. And that's why I was thinking something simple. And I know that, you know, each office wants to highlight their work, but they're going to have to highlight it in two <laughs> sentences exactly. and, put it in, to and put it in quick notes. That's right. Because it seems to me that's just too many things. That's, that's great. 
So yeah. the, the, the MCPS website, so this is the central office website. We, we covered a lot of this earlier, 207 school websites. Um, this website, our central website, houses roughly 50,000 plus documents that are essential. We, we tried to sort through and figure out what, what we can cut because it seemed a little bit bulky. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that someone accesses one of these documents at least once a year and that level of transparency and information is critical. Mm -hmm. So what we've done to make it easier is that we've elevated all the things through analytics so what people search the most ends up in these buttons on the top and the bottom. But really, the website is a search tool. Yeah. Whatever you type in is what we hope that you can find. So we use what we call search engine optimization. So based on what keywords you type in is what's elevated. What's based on, it's, uh, what other people have searched for prior to, it's what's elevated as well. So those two techniques bring to the top, just like uh, the Google tool, and it's actually a Google tool built in. Um, what you find though is that sometimes old documents come to the top because people have searched a lot of the old document in the past. Um, and what we're doing is spending a lot of time searching through there, figuring out what can be pulled out, uh, what needs to be elevated intentionally through our systems, and what's just going to be naturally found. Are we changing our logo? So are we are. We I was just going to say, I, I, maybe this is not happening, but it's, I, on Twitter and social media, yeah. I noticed I was having a very hard time finding us because I didn't recognize the... <laughs> and I kept being like, this must be a different school system. Mm -hmm. Are we going to let people know if we're changing the logo? So, so, so we've been going through this transition actually about two years now. Um, and the, the goal is the, the lamp of knowledge said a lot about MCPS 20 years ago. And everyone was adopting it. It was a kind of a traditional method. But it didn't, no one could, if you didn't know what it was before, it was hard to understand. And what we've done has been more explicit about who we are. So our, our, our logo is now with our tagline expanding opportunity, unleashing potential, so that people, when they come to our site, when they see our, our, our logo, they know what we stand for, they know who we are. Uh, anything else? And, and I'll, I'll share with uh, Lori Christina Webb, who helped us develop this great tagline. I like the tagline, I'm just not sure why we couldn't have just put it right under the old MCPS <laughs> symbol. <laughs> um, Do we part, have part a symbol? Yes, we used to. So it used to be the, the lamp of see knowledge? the lamp on the bottom? On the bottom of your sheet. Yeah, that's, that's it. the yeah. new one? No, that's, that's our old one. one. Oh, okay. That's yeah. what we've always so had. So what's the new one? And so now it's word art. So if you go There's back nothing. one, you'll no see, um, this is the, the older version. It says um, Maryland's largest school system because we used to have Rockville underneath there. But if you don't know what Rockville is, uh, it's, it's harder to understand. And just Montgomery County Public Schools. And now that we've added our tagline underneath there, it really tells us who we are. And again, expanding opportunity and unleashing potential. Um, so, so there's no pictures, what do you say? Is that <laughs> common? I mean, I so it seems like, like most it logos are an yeah. image with the tagline. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so what we're learning is that word art has as much power as images. How um, are we learning that? So we're seeing other people doing um, what we call uh, benchmarking with other jurisdictions, and we're seeing that the, the logo means something, but if you don't know what that image is, you don't have any context. But if you know what Montgomery County Schools is, you can see the words you know exactly what it is and exactly what we stand for in one in one viewing. Um, so I just wanted to show you a quick uh, hit of the MCPS website in Spanish. Uh, we do, again, the main website in all six languages. We call them mini sites because they have different content depending on what language based on what we're seeing as a feedback from, from that community. Uh, media outreach. Uh, this is, uh, takes up a bulk of uh, the work in our office, uh, depending on the crisis of the day. Um, uh, we send out press releases to tell people about the good things that are going on, sharing the news, whether it's board information or whether it's um, uh, awards. I think we sent out one about national merit finalists last week. Um, so it's a great way to get information to the media. Um, what we also do is actually send all press releases to staff as well because we, we realize that they are great conduits of information. And so every press release goes to every staff member um, that they can share and they can understand the same information as it's happening. Um, we have a monthly press conference. I think uh, we have a, a statewide PIO meeting uh, every, for the first time this year. And all the, the communications folks from every school district came together. And I said, who else has a press conference monthly with their superintendent? And everyone looked at me like I had two heads. Because we want to be proactive and share information with our community about what's important. And, and not only address the positive things, but handle the tough issues. 
And Superintendent Smith has just been so thoughtful about engaging with the media through this platform uh, and, and so willing to be flexible with communication saying, let's try something new, let's try something that's gonna put you in the spotlight but helps us address the big issues before they come out in the news, help us take on tough issues with the public directly. Uh, and while this is built for the media, it's actually live streamed uh, through YouTube and through our social media channel. So if you want to watch the press conference, you can tune in and get all that same information as a regular member of the public. Uh, story pitching, we're constantly calling media about uh, great stories, things that are happening, things that are important to us, things that we need to talk about and celebrate. Um, we reach out in multiple languages. So uh, we have a Spanish communications uh, specialist who has a regular program on Univision every Friday, I believe, um, and talks about things that are important to the, the school system, things that are important to the families uh, who are watching that program. We've had Chinese language rap media roundtables where all the local Chinese media come sit with a superintendent and staff. We do the same thing with Korean media and we're constantly looking for other media outlets to come to the table so that we are reaching all of our community members. Uh, and of course there's responsive media engagement. Uh, dozens of calls every week uh, about the topic of the day. Um, one of the challenges that we face is that there's a, a dearth of local media since the Gazette went away. Uh, and I look at Meredith because she, she helped run a Gazette a few years ago. Um, and, and it's a challenge for us um, because sometimes the reporters who cover us have five jurisdictions to cover. They're covering Fairfax and Prince George's and Howard County. So when they come to us, they have to tell one story and it might not be the story they want to tell because they've got many things to do. Others have to do multiple stories a day, and so the stories are quick and, and may not have all the right information and just uh, have to be out there to, to meet a deadline. And so that's a challenge that we face every day, and we even lost a media outlet, the Germantown Pulse, recently. So we're, we're constantly looking for more opportunities to get media, which is why we love our student journalists. Our schools are the best, best yeah. source of information for Absolutely. our students, and they ask the hardest questions. I think because they they're sure so do. informed and engaged <laughs> in the uh -huh. classroom, they know, they know the, the, how it's implemented. Uh -huh. I have tougher times with those students than I do with any other reporters because they, 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 they call you on things. They're like, that's how, not, how it, not how it looks in our schools. Right. Um, and so Love we've that. reached out to them, had media roundtables with them, invite them to the press conference, and we try to give them the last question if they don't have the first question because their voice is so important in uh, understanding the system. I, I have a question though. Sometimes the media doesn't portray the story exactly as we understand the story. Mm -hmm. And we don't respond. What's the policy on that? Or do you have a policy? Or is it just one of those things policy. that you can't respond to everything? I don't, I don't know what it is. So it's a combination. A lot of it was just responding behind the scenes. So mm -hmm. calling journalists and saying, you need to fix this. So I would say, roughly a third of stories that I, I find are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I actually have a conversation and the story's changed online and the people who in the public are, are, don't know about it because we've changed a paragraph, we've added new names. We've it's kind of it like up. changing it where they put it on the back page because I haven't seen any changes. They'll <laughs> <laughs> <It'll laughs> say updated on the, it'll, yeah, it'll say the updated bottom. The timeline. So they're not, what, what, rarely do they say okay. anymore like we've changed this story. It's just like they change the I've time of when it's posted. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, other times we have conversations with them and try to correct the record and have a second story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we struggle because they're unwilling to change. They believe they have it right, uh, even when they don't. And uh, that's just a, a relationship issue that, that we need to overcome. I would, um, to address this issue of the media outlets trying to cover the whole DMV and the lack of, um, would it, you think it would be helpful to put out more press releases? because there you have it already written and easy to turn into a story rather than having to dig for information or contacting you or getting it wrong. Yeah, so we do that through story pitching and actually calling the journalist directly to give them a story so that, that they can own it. Um, it's, it's, they feel better about it because they feel like they have some ownership and they're getting a unique experience. Uh, and so my colleagues spend a lot of time just dialing the phone saying, hey, are you interested in this? Are you interested in this? In addition to some of the big things so that there's, there's a sense of I'm not getting the same story as everyone else. Under, I, I didn't, I was going to bring this up maybe during the social media section mm -hmm. or whatever, but in terms of responsive media engagement, I don't really understand what that means. But if we put something out there on Twitter, for example, 
um, and people start writing stuff. I know we don't ever respond. We don't we don't write back. That's not actually accurate. Um, I mean, there's this one lady on um, on Facebook that clearly is not a happy MCPS <laughs> parent. <laughs> um, and but everything you know, there's so many of the things that I read that she posts are not accurate. And I don't feel like it's my position to get into arguments over. Mm -hmm. You know whether or not anybody did their fact checking before they say we don't have any marching bands it in our football at our football games you know um and that's a big problem with our school system but it would be nice if somebody would go on and just kind of clarify because you know things have a way of even if it looks like it's not hitting fifty thousand followers things have a way of spreading around and years and years ago Back in the Jerry Weist days, um, somebody used to reply to stuff, particularly with um, one of our coalition groups that tends to focus on the negative. But we don't do that anymore. And I'm just curious why we don't have somebody who's monitoring social media or whatever, or even regular news, you know, in the comments things to, to clarify things. So there's two parts of this. Actually, we do have someone who actually monitors our social media channels and, and makes sure that, that things are, are addressed. There, there's two, two strategies to responding to, to social media. There's, there's responding and engaging directly with folks and trying to correct the record. But sometimes when we do that, we actually elevate the profile of those who are criticizing us, and that gives them more attention. And then they come back and they want to keep following and engaging with us. And then there's expectation that we keep engaging with them, and that builds their profile, builds their followers, and legitimizes the work that they're doing, even though it's incorrect. So we have to be really thoughtful about when we engage and who we engage with, because when we point 113,000 followers towards a response, that's that means that we're saying there's something legitimate about here. There's something we're actually concerned about with these tweets, and we get tagged in hundreds of posts each day um, <laughs> that, that we couldn't respond to in a meaningful way. Uh, the other is that we actually, on, on some of these tougher things, we actually pull the conversation offline. When people ask about like my kid X, Y, or Z, we'll actually respond and say, can we, can we give you a call? Let's follow up that way and have that actual personal touch mm -hmm. because responding over so social media is just so impersonal. Uh, and I'll let Meredith talk more about what she does every day. Um, I'd also note that um you know, there are different types of questions and responses that we get on social media, and some are very clearly legitimate questions, and absolutely we always respond to those. Um, people might have questions about a bus. Um, I've directed people to the Department of Transportation if they want to know about a bus route, for instance. Um, people might want to know who to call if they're having a challenge in their child's school. Um, those questions absolutely always get a direct response, but we also have to be thoughtful about our students and FERPA and identifying basically personal information about students. And then we have what's called our trolls. Um, and every, everybody has those Absolutely. online. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, Montgomery County, they did. <laughs> and the question is, do you respond and elevate that conversation or which feeds, feeds the beast? Or do you step back and say, this person is trying to provoke and not get a response? And part of the thinking there, too, is what example are we setting for our students if we go after, come back at people who come after us, right? Um, I wasn't for, trying to imply we should be aggressive or mean. Sure. I'm just saying, sure. speaking of communications, maybe at some point we could do something about our microphone situation. Oh, just what my out there. I never <laughs> in six years I've not understood why everybody can't push their button. But. <laughs> Um, so those, those are just some of the things that we think about. What deserves a response? What's legitimate? What's somebody trying to um, ask a rhetorical question? Um, and in regards to the false information, um, we certainly have had instances where media outlets have put up half correct information. And I can recall a couple of occasions where we've reached out and said, hey, please give us a call. And we're happy to talk to you about this more. And people have, which is great. OK. And there have been occasions where we've had to respond via social media to something that's completely inaccurate from the media because what we don't want to do is cause a crisis because they put information out. So like right. those urgent situ emergency situations, we will use whatever tactic it takes to make sure that we don't create a crisis. Mm -hmm. So next up, television and video production. Um, what's, what's so amazing is that we have a team of people who, who can tell the most amazing stories. And we know that, that video content is king these days, uh, whether it's video through social media um, or, or video on new digital streaming platforms. 
that's how people like to digest information. And because of our MCPS TV team, led by Dip Dick Lipsky, who's right here, um, we, we have that ability. And, and more and more, we're moving away from the traditional, we, ha we have a TV station. We're moving away from content directed for that to con content directed for YouTube, which is an ever-growing channel, and content directed for social media. Um, and the TV team allows us to do what we're doing right now, broadcast this meeting, which is not only being broadcast on the TV station, it's being broadcast on the Board of Education social media feed. And if you want to get really meta, you could pull up the MCPS website right now and watch ourselves watching the meeting, talking about ourselves watching the meeting. Uh, be, and if you go on Twitter, you can very see it Very inception, very confusing. Live streaming. <laughs> Um, so we, we wouldn't be able to do our work without uh, TV production to be able to tell those, those important stories, stories with affect. Um, I think it's worth noting in this situation that uh, there's been a change to federal communication law and some of the funding that has allowed us to keep um, our, our TV production going is going to, be, is going to go away soon. And, and so we are, um, we are, we are desperate to, to figure out a strategy to make sure that we can continue with the video content moving forward. Uh, and it's just That's so huge. important. Um, and our, our county, through the public uh, educational and governmental uh, fund, uh, funds these programs. It funds Montgomery College, uh, MCPS, the county cable. That's crazy. And if all that funding goes away, all that content could likely go away as well. So, so we're, we're concerned and in, a, in an interesting universe right now. Is it a lot of money? Uh, MCPS receives roughly $1.8 million from the, the PEG fund every year. Mm -hmm. Is it closed caption? Correct, it is closed caption, and it's closed caption on the website as well. So you could w read the words as you're watching yourself, watching yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this might seem like a small thing, but on the cable listings, is there a way that we could actually advertise what is going to be showing instead of it just saying local programming for everything so people could know if they're watching TV, like what? what's going to be on or when something's going to be on and record it if they want or so we have two providers one is Verizon and one is Comcast and I'm not sure, I can't remember which is which but one doesn't allow for that system am I, am I correct well, I have Verizon and we don't Verizon refuses to negotiate with yeah, the Verizon doesn't have oh. that okay I'm like cause it's really annoying if I wanted to watch one of the high school graduations I didn't know how to when it would be on <laughs> um, so next up social media and I'll turn back to uh, Ms. Williams sure. So MCPS operates official accounts in both English and Spanish on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, and additionally, we have a presence on LinkedIn, and the board operates a Twitter account as well. Um, social media is, is helpful for us because it allows us to reach a very broad audience. We have students on these platforms, parents and guardians, staff, and then the broader community and our community partners. Um, and we're also able to get some metrics in regarding how many people see our content on a given day and how many people interact with it. So it's really helpful for gauging how many people are seeing content at a given time. Um, these platforms are constantly evolving and that's a challenge. So the way people use Twitter two years ago is not the way they use it today. And same with Facebook and YouTube. So we look regularly at how we should be using these platforms if we need to change our practices. Um, and we also look at whether we need to be on other platforms, whether they're new, whether it's they're true. evolving. So the investigation um, involves analyzing our audience and their needs and looking at our resources and our content. So do we have the resources and do we have the right material to be on those platforms? So right now we're actually assessing whether or not we need to be on Instagram. I was say, it's and really it seems to be growing. <laughs> it is growing. <laughs> um, but, crowd. <laughs> yeah, but part of the assessment involves looking at who we would be reaching on that platform mm -hmm. and if it is actually the most efficient and effective way to reach those people or if there's a better space to reach them. And I can speak to the communication survey for a minute it. Um, part of that survey came from us questioning whether we needed to be on Nextdoor, which is essentially like a community listserv. Mm -hmm. um, and we really weren't sure how many people in this community were making use of that platform. And um, based on benchmarking and based on that survey data, we determined that a very small percentage of our community was there and we were already reaching those people mm -hmm. in other ways. So in that instance, that was not a good use of resources. So we'll employ similar tactics in looking at whether Instagram is a space for us um, and what we, would, what we would put there. 
I have a question. Um, I didn't know you were on LinkedIn, but my my question is, do we post job openings on LinkedIn? Yeah, I was going to ask that too. And is there a link to take you straight to human resources so that you actually can? Oh, this is my favorite conversation. So yes, we have a LinkedIn profile. It's, it's actually one of our larger social media profiles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we do uh, post job postings, but we struggle right now. LinkedIn doesn't talk to our HR system as it is. So you can't go directly to a job posting. You have to go to a job number. And so as, as we talked about before with the, the ERP, which is the, the new business set of systems, the goal is to have these two systems talk to each other so that we can have um, uh, a LinkedIn HR account that actually speaks to our HR account so that people can apply through and we can actually pull candidates that way because that's where everyone else is and it's a place that we need to be mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would put in a, a plug for Dextdoor because it's very active in our community. Mine too. I don't understand though how you would do that since each community kind of has right. a Nextdoor anyway. They, they do have a kind of governmental account that, that you okay. can use, but again, we need to make sure that when we put the resources into it, we can maintain okay. it. And that's, okay. we want to make sure we have, we're not starting something that we can't keep going. Yeah, I'm not sure what you would actually put on Nextdoor, yeah. but I will say there's a bunch of things that get listed in my community where I want to go in and write, oh, you could do, you know, like someone <laughs> wanted to donate a car, and of course I wanted to go on and write, <laughs> you know, we have an automotive <laughs> foundation where you could donate the car, kids can work on it, resell it, make money. But, but I just want to circle back to LinkedIn again because, you know, I'm very concerned about our recruitment mm -hmm. efforts. So when do you think we might be able to mm -hmm. do something with that? So we're currently exploring LinkedIn through the HR platform for this year. Um, okay. we, we got some of the information last year and we're going through the process of, of looking at this year. Mm -hmm. um, but we're actually taking a lot of different tactics this, this year and the last year around recruitment, especially of diverse candidates uh, who are qualified. We actually bought access to a platform called uh, I think HBCU Connect that allowed us to connect directly through our HBCUs to, to potential candidates. Uh, good news and bad news. Good news, again, innovation. We tried something new. Bad news is that we got very few candidates from the platform, uh, but we learned a lot of lessons, like whether this was the right tool to reach our community. And we, we're, we do a lot of exploring like that um, just to figure out what's working. Okay. If it's not, we're, we're happy to abandon it and try something else. Mm -hmm. All right, um, ask MCPS. So this is um, a, an important tool and, and one that's used by a lot of our families, though it kind of goes under the radar. Mm -hmm. So if you have a question about the school system, you can just pick up the phone and call, and there's someone there to answer the phone to help point you in the right direction if they don't know the answer. Um, and it's in English and in Spanish, uh, and it's both email and phones. So there are two people specifically assigned to ask MCPS. But literally, the entire public information office picks up those phones and answers questions on behalf of the school system. Um, and sometimes we get very simple questions like, what's on the menu for lunch today? Uh, and sometimes they're, they're much more complex questions like, my child is in crisis. How can, how can I find help? And so this is a tool that, that go, again, goes under the radar, but is, is so important for us to engage with families and to, to support them. Because sometimes they're, they're not questions that you can search on a website. They're so specific to your family, so specific to what you, you actually need. So what do we do if the person speaks neither English nor Spanish and speaks one of our other four languages? That's a, the perfect transition. So as we're talking about languages, we have two, two tools that we can use. Mm -hmm. One, we have uh, interpreters and, and translators who, who are in central office who are sometimes available for that. More importantly, we have a system called Language Line where you can access I believe over 130 languages where a person comes in or calls and they say, what language are you speaking? And they connect to the interpreter of whatever language that is. Uh, and MCPS Office of Communications actually takes uh, on the cost of all those phone calls. And so every school has access to this service. Ask MCPS has access to access to the service as well. I would... Um I know that the home page is uh, highly coveted in terms of what goes on there, but you shouldn't have to search for the phone number. Right. It should be on the, the home page. Um, and, and it is. It's at the bottom of the page. So that's that's the struggle we have with with, <laughs> with the big. <laughs> oh, all. The, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and then with the language line, you know, it's again, it's there, but if you don't keep reminding, 
school personnel to use it, oftentimes it it becomes part of the furniture, right? The, the little chart. Uh, that, what is that thing? Oh, that's the language line uh, guide. <laughs> that, that, that's correct. And we're actually seeing more and more schools using language lines in the last three years as our our population becomes more diverse and people become more familiar with the tool. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing more calls and more minutes on the language line. So we, we think that's a, a positive, while financially a, a more expensive uh, uh, mechanism, it's actually really positive for our community. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to go back to Twitter uh, quickly. I know we've had this conversation before that um, I feel that Twitter in Spanish really reaches um, yeah. more highly educated professional demographic, but you've told me that um, Spanish media are on it, yes. and so it's worth your time and effort to continue to put out messages in Spanish and Twitter because the media is picking mm -hmm. it up. So I just wanted to put that out because I, yes. I know before I used to say, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? It's not reaching the target populations, but if it is reaching the media and they reach the target populations, then it's right. worth our time. And, and we also have a I Spanish Facebook account, um, which helps read, read more parents. And they found the, if I'm correct, we did some a survey before I came here that said, Spanish-speaking families prefer Facebook as a, yep. as a mm -hmm. tactic for outreach. Mm -hmm. are, are we looking at updating the website? And I don't mean just updating it yearly. I mean updating it so I don't have to go through five clicks to find the bus schedule. So, yes, two, two answers to that. Um, mm -hmm. We actually did a refresh of the website um, that has the analytics as they're lifted up. So bus schedule is actually list, listed on the homepage. And uh, per our last conversation, we've actually <laughs> you fixed it. We, we've, we've made the that. fix. Thank you. Um, I check. But two, it's it's also a search-based site. It's it's hard mm -hmm. to elevate everything in the right times. Mm -hmm. So we really do encourage people just type in whatever whatever you think you're looking for. And we're actually trying to find not only the keywords, but words in proximity to that to match mm -hmm. so that you don't have to type in the exact phrase that, that's needed. You can type in a bunch of different things in the universe and they'll all bring you to the right content. Uh, but that's evolving. The, the second piece is we're actually uh, updating the entire um, infrastructure of the website, the behind the scenes part, which is a content management system, so that we can actually push more content onto school websites centrally, and we don't and we don't have to rely on the schools to make certain content updates. And it's a lot easier for schools to use, so they're, they're more likely to want to update if it's just a two button click versus I have to know HTML code, which is <laughs> not, not something that people uh, have uh, at their hand all the time. <laughs> So the Maryland Public Information Act request. Um, this is one of the uh, more often used tools now for the public to, to reach out for information. Um, so anyone can access information. They don't have to tell you who they are. They just have to say, under the Maryland Public Information Act, I would like these documents. And it's really a question for documents. So anything that's printed, any emails, any text messages, all of those things are, are uh, accessible through the Maryland Public Information Act. Um, what, what we found is that in the last few years, as the more transparent we become, the more people want more information. So the 216 is a record from last year, up from 130 in FY 2015, I believe. So, so we're seeing a jump, and it's not just a jump in number, it's a jump in complexity. They're looking for complex documents and information. What you can also request is databases. So the database to a system and all the information that feeds into it. So that's a complex situation. All parents are asking for all emails about their child um, from any teacher being exchanged because they they have an issue. Potentially, it doesn't have to do anything with MCPS. It's a it's a custody issue, but they're using MCPS uh, information as a proxy in, in those fights. Um, that's just not right. And and. There, we, you know, we, we have a 30-day deadline to respond to any MPIAs. We can charge um, uh, community members who request um, information because it actually is a lot of work, tens of yeah. thousands of hours to do this work. Um, and, and what they people don't realize is that it's not just one person sitting there going through all this work. It's every office has to pull and gather and redact information. And that's pulling away from the other work that they should be doing. Right. We have teachers who have to pull their own emails. We have staff who are, who are pulling documents from boxes so that they can comply with an, an MPIA. So we want to really be thoughtful about um, when we charge uh, community members because that, that's a lot of taxpayer money that, that we're, yeah, we're utilizing. Yeah, I've oft, often thought we, we should be charging not just more in terms of a higher yeah. dollar amount, but more people who 
are continuously making requests because I think that they think, well, it's free and it's whatever, so we'll just keep asking. And um, it does take up so much staff time. It's crazy. Do you have any idea how many pages that translated into 216 requests? I have no idea because it's also digital pages and emails. So we've, we've combed through thousands of emails mm -hmm. for one MPIA. I, I understand um, that. And uh, it's not just someone look, you know, just saying yes, yes, yes. It's redacting student oh, names I and know, information. Um, and people put lots of things, parents in particular put lots of personal information in their emails that still become part of the system. So to, to all parents who are watching this, the emails you send to the school system um, are public documents that we have to look at and review and redact. So please be thoughtful about what you put in them. And I say that to yeah. staff as well. Please be thoughtful about what send you put in emails. Code. Exactly. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. One of the most important tools we have is community partnerships. Ken, before you go oh. on from that, can can you tell us, or maybe you can't, how you make a decision about who pays and who doesn't? So we really think about um, the the volume of the the request, uh, mm -hmm. the complexity of the request, because essentially after two hours we are allowed to charge. Right. And, and what we know is that if we can provide essentially similar documentation um, that doesn't require us to go through another 500 pages, we'll say, here's the, the baseline information. Mm -hmm. The rest of this information will cost you X number of dollars. Okay. Um, and that was certain, what I was getting yeah. at, whether or not you gave them some, some information and told them, now, there is something else, but if you want the something else, you should have, you will have to pay. Correct. We, we always okay. try to give a baseline of free okay. information. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, community partners, so they help make our, our help us reach our communities. What we know is that MCPS um, is good at reaching our, our own folks. We're not good at reaching people outside of our own uh, sphere, especially those who are disengaged or who are busy with other things. So we really rely on these partners, um, whether it's the MCC PTA, whether it's the county executive's office, mm -hmm. the county council, fire and rescue, the police, identity, the NAACP parents council, mm -hmm. CASA. We, we rely on them to help get messages out and they rely on us to do the same. Um, and it's so important that we, we partner uh, because we have a shared interest. Uh, last year, we hosted the first ever uh, LGBTQIA forum uh, with uh, par in partnership with the MCC PTA, and they were help they were able to help bring new constituents into this forum that probably wouldn't have shown up if we just said this is an MCPS event, um, and it's. It's so important for us to continue that partnership, continue to find ways to work together because they are experts at reaching their communities um, in a way that, that we just aren't at this time point. So is that a public information office function or is that a family community mm -hmm. partnerships function? Because mm -hmm. I know you were the lead for this event. Is that because there was a turnover and vacancy in partnerships or? So it's really a partnership on all of these. It, things come to our office and we'll take the lead on events, but then we'll pass them over with uh, student services and figure out how to make them work best. Uh, sometimes they're more communications focused, so they'll we'll organize that part um, and they'll organize the, the actual uh, event itself. Um, but but really, we, we work hand in hand, and, and with Everett on board, I think we're going to be even closer, sitting very close all the time on, on making sure these events uh, are successful. Uh, the Back to School Fair is a great example of this. Um, the communications team took the lead on the, the Back to School Fair this year, um, but the, the PCCs and Everett shop it were, were instrumental in making it happen. But this year, after we debriefed, we looked over and said, why don't you guys take the lead on, <laughs> on the organizing? Yeah, I'm trying to understand <laughs> the division of labor here. Just um, and one of the great things is that we try not to live in silos, and we're, we're getting better and better at that. If it doesn't matter what office you're from, you're going to come to the table and do the work. And everyone's so committed to the work that titles don't matter, offices don't matter, as long as we're getting it done. Do you have a, one of the you things? Have? One of the things that has concerned me, of course, everybody knows this, is that the access in certain parts of the county just isn't there. Even with the groups that you named, generally the meetings are somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Rockville might be it. And I, I want to encourage you to consider venues, times, and accessible locations that people can actually get to. And I realize that over in our part of the county, that's a real challenge because of transportation, number one. But I do think when you're thinking about things, particularly when you're thinking about um, 
like parent advocacy type meetings that you think about making sure that all parts of the county are involved in that. And, you know, it's one it's one thing to go over, let's say where I live, you know, you got Silver Spring, you got the 29 Carter, you got Olney. Wheaton was a great example of, to me, going to a community that you wouldn't normally hit, but it still probably didn't reach as many people from the the eastern part of the county as it could have. Yeah, so um, just think about that some. I don't, I think if you could work with maybe some of the community rec centers and mm -hmm. some of the, um, region, the regional service center over mm -hmm. there, they have a real end to the community and mm -hmm. they can tell you yeah, what's like a good east, option, yeah, you know? Uh, the East County. Um, yeah, so a that's just a thought I wanted to, to put out. I put that out there every time, you know? <laughs> if I could speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, part of my role, in addition to supporting the PCC's parent community coordinators, is also working with the parent academy. Mm -hmm. So to your point, Ms. Wolf, we were just looking at my instructional specialist and I were just looking at the parent academy uh, workshops, which we have uh, a series of in the fall, mm -hmm. in the winter, and also mm -hmm. in the spring. And we were looking at strategic locations that represent the entire district right. to make sure that we, we are, particularly with right. our parents who are underrepresented, uh, right. coming out to those sessions. Right, because what, what concerns me is when I listen to you talk, a lot of the um, community there is French speaking, so I know that yes. you're not getting the same participation as you're getting from other communities. But I do know that they respond to, you know, certain, certain people over there because they have those relationships. Relationships are very important, you know, so if you could look at it, or if you want to talk about it further, I would yeah. be glad to talk about it further. Thank you. Uh, yeah, make sure we're hitting up, down, east, and west. Yeah, and I, it is a challenge because transportation is a challenge exactly. there. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to punt to Laura Christina because I think we're in the same place here. We actually have met a couple of times to think about meeting people where they are and mm -hmm. taking taking our show on the road, including yeah. potentially board events. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we've we've talked about two things. One. Um, going to where people are, so so maybe in a uh, um, apartment complex where where we know has a lot of families there and and meeting them there. Also piggybacking on some of our community partners events mm -hmm. because folks who are coming out for another thing, how mm -hmm. can we capture yeah. that audience mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. already coming out because maybe there's a, a potluck. That, that the community is going to. So how do we leverage our partnerships right. on right. the ground um, right. rather than a lot of times we'll ask our partners, oh, can you get people out for us for right. this event? Rather than that saying, can we come to your event? Exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. And, and, and talk with folks. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we, we're thinking um, this year we'd really like to, and we'll get to that in the innovation right. yeah. Yeah. section, well, but we really want to try some things. Yeah, I highly recommend doing, we do a better job reaching out to our faith-based organizations exactly. as well. Some of those communities are so large and so involved and so engaged. And I've heard from, um, you know, senior living communities um, along as, as well as like interages and um, faith-based groups that are really um, like the Rockville ministry um, group you know, that really want to be involved and help and participate and connect with the school or schools and don't know how to, to do it. So um, the more that we can reach out to them, I think the better. And I'm going to turn on Everett's microphone for him because I know that he's been doing some great work already. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I can speak to that. In fact, I have an upcoming... Uh, luncheon with uh, Reverend Caseman, oh, good. Uh, who works very closely with the county executive. So I'm looking forward to speaking to him more about the faith-based community, but also some of our lesser represented uh, faith-based communities. So working together to pull collaborative efforts uh, is one of the efforts of our, of our office. And I want to circle back to the parent workshops again. Uh, we will be offering the uh, parent workshop in the fall uh, in close collaboration with our underrepresented faith-based community. Uh, so if you'll check that out when our, our information will be posted on the website uh, for that series. And sometimes where parents are is at home in their living room because mm -hmm. they can't get away for transportation, childcare, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. other obligations. So uh, I often see things, I'm like, oh, I wish I could go to that, but mm -hmm. I, I don't have time. So, you know, as much as we can, those parent academies, uh, 
if they lend themselves to recording and and then posting through your social media so that I can oh tomorrow when I'm mm -hmm. you know sitting at home with some quiet time at 11 o'clock at night I can play that it's or like podcast that. now it's this, this is a thing now right I'm right. driving mm -hmm. in I hit podcast. a topic yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's like you're beating us to all the good slides. Uh, um, <laughs> but we're, we, have, we have one in the middle, so um, advertising. So it's, it's not something we've done a lot in the past. It's something we're, we're trying again, seeing if it has an impact. So in the last three years, we've been buying social media ads. Um, and they actually, for a very limited cost, allow you to target communities. And so if you want to reach the people in the Seneca Valley area for the boundary uh, meetings, we can actually buy a social media ad that reaches specifically the people who live in that geographic area. We can target parents who are, uh, who are in MCPS or who have kids of that age. We can target people who don't have kids yet in MCPS if we're trying to bring people on board. It's a great tactic. Uh, it can be misused, uh, but so we, can, we see. But when we do it well and we are thoughtful about it, we can actually help bolster attention to, to certain events. Mm -hmm. And of course, bus ads. I love the we, bus ads. You know, we, we've, never, we've talked to you for years about doing bus so ads. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it worked or not, we're, we're still trying to find out. But we think it's really important because the bus ads take go to places that are hard to reach for yep. us. They drive thousands of miles, mm -hmm. and they are exposed to thousands of drivers every day for a month. And so this but bus, along <laughs> with six other buses, were driving across our county uh, over the month of August, uh, getting people ready for the back to school fair. Do you ever think about putting it on the school bus? So th the there's the actually a the law. There it are is. laws against putting I, things on school um, buses. We already okay. asked that one. Yeah. Okay, because that, that, that means be free. they go a lot of places. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's good to know. That would be free. <laughs> yeah. Hey, can I just um, go, uh, since it's, no, it's still, you can go to the next slide because it's actually, community outreach, it's about the faith-based um, thing. I just wanted to say, in terms of trial and errors, um, I think it was two years ago, we, um, as a board, went to meet with a church um, community in Gaithersburg, and we pull in, the sermon's going, there were hundreds of people there. Then it ended, and they had their pizza and everything in the kitchen, and that was when we were scheduled to, to meet. Mm -hmm. So I think there might have been like 10 people there that weren't from MCPS. <laughs> so, um, and I, it was great to speak with those 10 people, but um, just being strategic in terms of how we um, make our efforts mm -hmm. to, to work collaboratively with them. Like, you know, if it, I feel like it would have been a much better scenario had the um, the officiator, I don't know if it was a reverend, a preacher, whatever, but um, had invited just, you know, the superintendent, for example, to go up and say hello, and these are our board members, or whatever, and taken three minutes that way as opposed to an hour and a half where people just wanted to eat and leave because they were done. <laughs> so, um, community outreach, uh, we, as we talked about the back to school fair, this was uh, something we, we reestablished after five years and we realized we have to meet people where they are, we have to go out in the community, and we have to have all the resources together in one place, and in one place that's air conditioning was really helpful. Um, <laughs> uh, in previous years we've had it outside under tents and whether the rain or heat, um, you know, we had crowds or hurricanes uh, can be a distraction to the work. But we thought, saw thousands of people going through Westfield Wheaton, uh, picking up materials, asking questions. And not only were, were is it reactive where we could help people, but proactive. Table, people were going out from behind their tables and going and say, hey, have you heard about X, Y, or Z? And it was a really good chance for people to be uh, engaged with the community in a way that we haven't in a while. So we were really excited about that. We are really excited that um, Mr. Davis's team will, will help us out next year uh, leading the effort. <laughs> One of the, the innovations we've done this year is door knocking. Um, we've done it before in the past for specific instances um, around trying to get information. But this time we went out to the Arcola and Nick's community and knocked on doors of every single family member and said, hey, school's starting. And what do you need to know? What questions do you have? Here's a backpack. Here's some information. Here's some materials. We had people um, who were speaking Spanish and English and French all going on knocking doors. And what we found is that people were so excited to hear from their school. Uh, the prince, I got to the chance to go with the Arcola principal as we were going through the process. He would knock on doors, and we'd knock one time, see if anyone answered. No one would come. Knock twice, and still no one. He'd knock on the door. He's like, 
it's our Cole Elementary School, it's your principal, they, the door would fling open, they were just so <laughs> excited to see him, they're like, Mr. Jean-Philippe, like there's, <laughs> and, and they're so excited, so happy, and the parents were like, we're so excited this program is here, and that you came, mm -hmm. and you care enough to come to our house yeah. to see us. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, we caught a family who was dealing with the loss of a loved one, and, mm -hmm. and we just happened to knock on the door, and they, they welcomed us in with open arms and said, thank you for being here. Even though we know you, this wasn't on your schedule to be here during this day, thank you because their kid was just so happy to see that their principal cared. Um, and he's continued that effort, going out in the community, making sure they see him, they hear from the school. Uh, and this is one that we really hope to leverage in the coming year in new ways to, to really connect with community in a direct way. We did that with the Twinbrook community mm -hmm. when we were looking at the boundary and I just thought it was so impressive. Par families really took to heart and appreciated the fact that people came out and asked their opinion mm -hmm. on something and to just to ensure that their voice had been heard we i it's clear that that has a very powerful effect on our constituents and Ms. Sylvester, you mentioned earlier about um, meeting people where they are in the community and going to the events that, that already exist. Tabling has been uh, another tool that we found to be really effective in the last year. We went to Rockville Pride. We went to El Verano Soul, which is a uh, Spanish language music, music concert at the fairgrounds. Uh, we went to Wheaton Regional Park, set up a table, had materials and said, hey, we're here. And people... We saw tons of people just coming up to the table like, so glad you're here. What are you here talking about? And not only would we answer their questions, but we'd give them information. And then they felt a real connection. They would ask us things that were completely irrelevant to whatever event we were at. Right. Just wanting to know like, hey, this is a chance to talk to an MCPS person. Yep. And again, partnering with uh, Mr. Davis' shop to, with the PCCs, staffing those tables with communications folks. Again, a extremely effective way for us to meet people where they are based on the, especially on the needs they have the time. Rockville Pride, we had all the information about our gender identity guidelines. And I think half of the, the community who came up to the table said, we didn't know you had this. We didn't know that you supported us this way. Right. This is great. This is so important to us. I just wanted to remind us that 10 years ago, um, MCPS staff would make going to the Wheaton Mall a regular thing. Mm -hmm. And they had like a little kiosk like the, the vendors do mm -hmm. and the swarm of personnel yep. engaging people that were just shopping. And, and yep. um, you know, again, just, just what, what is your the question that you have pressing on your mind today? And, and that's yeah. right. We've gone away from... We've gone away from those face-to-face -to, -face to go to digital tactics, and, and yes, that those have been helpful, but we need to kind of step back and go back to those face-to-face -face interactions and really think about community organizing at its, at its core because we, we are part of this community, and what do, how do we leverage that? What, do, what resources do we need to actually be community organizers? My, my office, we're, we're great folks, but we're not community organizers. And I know Everett is, is a great example of this, but the, we, we need more of a foundation so yes. that we can go in and really strategize about different communities and not also overwhelm the PCCs who are doing a great job one-on-one -on -one with families. Um, Do you go to the community days, like Burtonsville is having theirs, right. Poolsville is having right. theirs, Damascus has? Right. Do you go to those? We try to sign so up for Rockville anything that they'll, they'll, they'll let us sign up for. The, the real uh, challenge is the capacity of staff, making sure people are available, because usually these are Saturdays, weekends right. um, yes. and require some overtime yes. and additional costs. So mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out a strategy to, to meet those needs and not uh, tax okay. our, our staff. Okay. Do we have anybody on staff that is off on... Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and works every, you know, Saturday, Sunday to do that kind of stuff? We don't have any flex schedules like that, but it's, it's one of those things that we need to figure out how do we, one flex schedule, but I don't think that's enough because I think Monday through Friday we still have plenty of work to do and how do we both yeah, add on to have that, that extra absolutely. support and maybe it's... Absolutely. Uh, maybe it's right. a new position to help us think but, about that. Maybe it's uh, exactly that's. I, I, and I've been talking. The reason I mention is because I've been talking about that new position, mm -hmm. that idea. You know, f not just for MCPS as a whole, but also mm -hmm. for as board members, we spend a lot of time on the road on weekends, and we don't have our own direct staff, with mm -hmm. the exception of our mm -hmm. chief of staff. So, having someone who is available to work on weekends and go to um, things with this has been very challenging so far. Well, frustrating. So one of the things I think we, we want to continue to talk about is how do we build the institutional expertise mm -hmm. around the community organizing piece? Uh, how do we really be strategic? Because the reality, even if we had one person with a flex schedule, that's, that's mm -hmm. one person. Well, how to, right. right, so how do, we, how do we really think about leveraging the resources that we have here in a strategic mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. knowing what the long-term benefit is of the face-to-face? 
interaction. And so how do we do that really in a smart way that really moves the needle for our, our families and our students? Okay. So what are we doing about that? In other words, I appreciate what you just said. Mm -hmm. You're having those conversations. Where are, where are they going to go? Do we have some sort of timeline that we're thinking? Is this just another conversation that we're going to have and talk about but not really? So I think one of the anything? things that we're, we're saying is that we, we don't currently have anyone with the right. kind of expertise mm -hmm. in community organizing that we think we need. So I'm that, saying I agree, that, but okay. when, how are we going to fix that? <laughs> I hear you. I'm just saying how are we fixing it? <laughs> So I think that's something that has budget implications. So we will, I will defer back to Laura Christina and the board on those questions. <laughs> okay. So we will continue the conversations. Okay. Thank you. As board, I'm just saying, as budget season is arriving, quickly coming upon us, these are the type of things that it needs to be more than a conversation or it's just going to be a conversation. And I know that we're running short on time, so I'm going to try to yeah. speed through some of these. One of the things we've talked about is how to meet people who are sitting on their couch and saying, I can't attend this event. Mm -hmm. One of the, the tactics we tried in the last two years is live streaming and virtual town halls. So we actually had a virtual town hall around condoms last year, along with our, our email to students. And what we did is we set up a, a text message line, an email, and a phone call. So live on air, you could, you could ask any question to uh, the, the panelists around condoms. And we had the, the head of HHS's department um, and we had one of, we had uh, Dr. Maria Navarro talking about condoms in schools. And we saw emails from students saying, what about this, what about this? Uh, we mm -hmm. saw texts from parents saying, how is this actually going to work? Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not only that we had it on, we had it on TV, but we had it online. We had it streaming through social media, mm -hmm. but we had it simulcast in English and Spanish at the same time. Wow. So on one TV mm -hmm. station, it was English. One TV station, in Spanish. We had YouTube in English and Spanish, social media in multiple languages. But we also had telephone. So what we also know is that some people don't have access to internet service. Mm -hmm. So you could call up the, the line and listen into the whole conversation and, and press a button to ask questions. So we really want to try to meet people where they are. We did the same thing with the budget presentation. Mm -hmm. In previous years, we've you know had these budget presentations. You'd have an auditorium with 500 people. You know, 300 people would show up. Most of them staff members. This year, we had 1,800 community members participate and engage in the program because of online analytics. We know this wow. because you could see, you could sit at your own home and say, "It's cold outside. I'm not going to this yeah. meeting, but I can learn about this conversation." Mm -hmm. We see thousands of people engage in the. Uh, choice program uh, immersion nights online because this is what they care about and they don't want to go to a meeting across the county they just want to know the information they don't care whether they're in person or not so really using those digital platforms to help uh, bridge that divide so traffic and travel and child care don't become barriers to information they just become uh, a new way to get information so you'll be doing more of these correct we plan to do uh, more of these in replacement of some of the versions of five of the same meeting in parts of different parts of the county. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's more effective and, and more efficient. Uh, and then, well, I'll turn it back over to uh, the parent community coordinators. Uh, and, and I know we're short on time, mm -hmm. so um, they're just such an important tool for us to do outreach. And uh, Mr. Davis, if you have sure, anything to add. I can just give a brief synopsis. There are 38 of our parent community coordinators. That's kind of the other half of my responsibility, if you will. Um, the primary group of our PCCs are assigned to schools and they work there one to two days per week. Uh, the assignment is based on farms and also um, in secondary in particular, it's based on our MET sites, so for our middle schools and our high schools. Uh, in addition to that, I know Mr. Turner mentioned earlier the languages that we support. We have seven of our PCCs that are system-wide. So while I mentioned of the 38, uh, the majority of them are school, they're all school-based, but the seven uh, provide support system-wide. So if there's a, a particular principal, um, for example, in my previous school, um, who was not supported directly by a PCC, I can make that request because I had a particular need in a particular language such, such as Amharic, as just to give you an example, and we would have a PCC to come out and support. Uh, they do support many functions, system-wide functions, as Mr. Turner has mentioned, as well as their school-specific functions. Um, and I would say for now, and where we could really use support, 
um, from the folks at this table is really getting the word out about what our, not just the, my particular division does, but what our entire office, the supports that we provide. Because as I've been doing school visits, which actually I just came from one uh, prior to this meeting, it's very interesting for me to hear um, the, the increase of knowledge that's needed uh, in order for us to meet some of the challenges that our students, parents, and even schools are facing, that we have the resources, but I just don't know that they're all being uh, capitalized on. Going back to the communication side of it, mm -hmm. I'm not yeah, sure that we know what your off each office necessarily mm -hmm. does or offers, or so I wouldn't really know how to put the word out other than I would just say, reach out to our community and family services <laughs> division. <laughs> They'll help you. <laughs> so it might be helpful for all of us in sure. terms of promoting what you do to actually have a better understanding of what your office does. I'm wondering if, if that's something that could be put out through one of those three communications that comes out, what, once a week, twice, every other week, and once <laughs> yeah. a month. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe you should start highlighting some of those people so that they know that they're out there mm -hmm. and what they do. Yep. That's great. At the uh, top of the page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't have to successes search. Successes and, and failures. We've covered a lot of the successes. Mm -hmm. So we're going Oh. Successes and failures. We've covered a lot of the successes, and I just one more I want to highlight is uh, we had a grand opening for the Thomas Edison High School of Technology. Um, it's a system, uh, a system wide program, a system wide school. So we actually got to partner with the school and again with uh, student services to create this great event. So it was beyond just ribbon cutting. Everyone could go to the classrooms and learn about the class. We we worked with. Uh, our graphics department to create sheets that go outside of every door that not only tell what the program is, but the salaries that go with if you finish this yep. program and the licenses you get, really connecting it to the real world. I had more parents come out of there than kids say, how do I get into this program? Yeah. Is there an adult version of this? I said, go to Montgomery College. But this is, this is actually a, a great example of us working together as partners and trying something new as a system to really bring the word out about um, our focus on college and career readiness. And then we have um, the back to school fair, which I think we've already covered. Um, and then we have- Well, well we just want to say about the back to school fair that the, thanks to Ms. Wolf, the, the board's table was <laughs> swamped yes, at the back were. to school fair, which is of all the back to fair, school fairs I've ever been to, the only time yeah. the, the board's table was the most thanks popular. Thanks to great prizes. <laughs> Did you, you win, Lori. <laughs> you win, Ms. Webb, you win. Yeah. Did you get we any pushback win. because it was so, for, so down county? So we actually provided bus transportation from five sites across the county. So um, buses were going from schools delivering family members. But we also, it's made it metro accessible. So you could actually ride the metro depending on where you were. It's always hard in, in Montgomery County because it was 500 square miles to get any place But you place did that, get bus participation? For we did. We got significant bus participation. Okay. participation. Where were the sites? Uh, I'd have to get those to you. But okay. there were some up county, further down have? county. You have numbers of how many people rode from each different location? I believe so. Um, school safety conversations, great topic, important information. This is one where we decided we want to try to go to every community and have this conversation. And we promoted it and we, we thought we were doing a, a really meaningful level of outreach. What we found is that law of diminishing returns, we went to different communities. After the first meeting we had, maybe 30 folks there, second meeting, 10, third meeting, five. By the last meeting, the only two attendees. And that's because we have multiple channels for getting this information out, and mm -hmm. they had heard it by the time it got to their part of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and then we realized we, we spent a lot of effort to go out and prepare those spaces um, and, and prepare those events. And really, we should have taken a step back and said, maybe this is a virtual community conversation with the same people where they can still engage those, mm -hmm. ask those questions. Mm -hmm. People don't need to be in the room to ask those, those questions about safety and security, but they need to have a place to ask those questions. But it was also a time of year when there was a lot going on. I remember that, that's exactly the right. previous <laughs> mob saying, is there a community outreach calendar that we could right. see? Because we didn't same even know it was coming up yeah. because there was so much going exactly. on around that time. That's and these right. are the type of things that are, to me, would seem fairly easy to tack on to somebody else's community event, say, can we have 15 minutes just to let people know? And then if they have more questions, they can come over to us separately. But thinking about that kind of stuff in the future in terms of partnering with other activities that are already planned so people don't have to, 
you know, there, you could be out every single night, really, yes. you know, even if you didn't want to. <laughs> and so anything you can do to combine um, activities, I feel like is very meaningful. And that's really an important lesson we learned. Like, how do we, how are we efficient with our time and resources yeah. and, and our, our parents and family members' time? Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's a precious resource. And if we overload them with things, again, they're going to tune out immediately. Yeah. Um, so this is the most exciting part, the innovation part. Mm-hmm. Um, and we should have put this in front so that we can get to it faster. Um, technology information. We, talk, we talked about the student information system and text messages and how do we think about other mechanisms to reach families. Are there more things we can add to the virtual town halls so it's more engaging? Are there smart devices that we can leverage that have information? Um, and the hint is yes. Um, uh, so so well, how can we leverage technology to help bring people closer? Second, how can we enhance customer service? We, we talked about this uh, pretty in depth. The, the idea of those first face-to-face experiences mean so much to families. How do we do customer service training in a meaningful way? How do we help make that connection more, more powerful? Um, and let's, I, I really want to find ways to innovate and explore that. I know other school districts have, have done the Secret Shopper and have done training. What can we do in MCPS to make a difference? Um, and then dynamic events and community organizing. We've talked about the, the idea of us having events and pushing it out to people, but what, how do we more embed ourselves in events? How do we have things that are maybe education adjacent that will help bring people in, right? Because if you're, you don't care about policy or you don't care about school safety because you don't have kids there yet, what's the mechanism to get them interested in what the school system has to offer? Mm-hmm. Let's have ben- events that talk about big picture ideas about education, about bias, about culture. Mm-hmm. Let's bring them in and then say, here's what we ha- now here's what we have at Montgomery County Public Schools. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if people came in for, for understanding of hidden bias in education and left knowing more about our uh, equity accountability model, I think we would be better for it. Or an opportunity to volunteer with interages or yep. somehow that they can do something about what they heard about. That's right. We, we are in a, in a position where we can either sit back and things can keep going and we'll be fine. We'll still <laughs> engage with you know 100,000 people and have lots of messages. But are we moving the needle for our families, for our kids? And if we, if we can't say yes, then we're, we need to do more and we have to do more. And that's a great note to end on. I did want to that's just close yeah. with uh, my, my message I want to reemphasize is uh, what you said at the beginning. People, parents want to hear from their principal, from yes. their school leader, yep. a trusted person. Yep. If the principal says something, I'm going to pay attention regardless of every, all, the, all the noise. Mm-hmm. So I know that, uh, again, consistency. What yeah. is happening across the board, expectations in terms to make sure that all principals are communicating in some manner. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's consistent enough. Um, and I know that you send messages to principals with, here's, here's some messages that you can pick and choose and put into your communications to your mm-hmm. parent communities. Um, you know, I think those are gold. Those are very valuable, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd love to see them utilized more. <laughs> right. Thank you. And I, I agree. And I, you know, I kind of adding on to that. You had mentioned earlier about knowing your community, and I, so I don't think that every little thing necessarily has to go out to the community. You know, if a kid was stung by a bee and had a reaction and the ambulance comes, but if you know your community, you'll know that they've That's already, right. seven people have texted me, why is there an ambulance in front of my kid's school? Do I need to get over there? Um, so it would be helpful if, uh, and but again, that goes back to the whole having strong leadership in our buildings and making sure that they do know their community and um, and can respond and, and reply. I know that obviously this is not going to be the meeting for this. Um, hopefully, we'll have another one very, very soon. But because um, we didn't get a chance to discuss any of our internal communications, really, and how we connect with each other in order to stay connected, I have concerns with the um, our serious incident reports um, that come out. They're very generic, mm-hmm. and so you know. I assume the point of notifying board members and and administration about something that happens in the schools is because they're potentially going to be questioned about it, and we get very little information. I mean, I find out most of the stuff from Bethesda Beat 
more so than us. And, and I, I can speak to that. This, the, the serious incident reports are actually written uh, to not reveal student information mm -hmm. because they're also um, accessible through the Maryland Public Information Act. Right. And so we, we don't want to expose children unintentionally when we put a uh, significant amount of data in those reports. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you're free, feel free to give uh, OSSI a call, give us a call, and we'll happy to give you the, the details and, and brief you. Um, we just don't want mm -hmm. that, that student information unintentionally That's getting public. If someone requests right. Right. every single... Right. Right. <laughs> we could still call them student A and student B, but just, you know, the police were called. And then, like I said, I, then I have to find out from the... Bethesda beat. It's it's not just the name. It's sometimes if you put enough of the facts that They'll it makes the student identifiable right. and we can't do that. Right. Okay. Okay. Does anybody life. else have anything? Well, I want to thank you all. This was excellent. I learned a lot. Uh, I also want to say that our next meeting is October the 15th. And so we'll be talking. Thank you. Thank you. October where? 15th. Oh, good. So it's not so far away.